Our dearest viewers from across the world, we extend our condolences, our most heartfelt condolences upon the anniversary of the murder and of the tragedy of Karbala, the death of our dear Holy third Imam, Imam al Hussein al Islam, and of course, we extend our condolences to our dear awaited Saviour. May Allah hasten his reappearance. We thank you for joining us for another night here in the days of Ashram Muharram on Verses of Love, where, as we've explained many a time, we are delivering to you verses of poetry but also simple lessons taken from this absolutely tragic episode that we must must take further than just tears we combine the tears with the education it solidifies our aqaid that we can take forward in order to be amongst the best servants of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ta for tears by themselves are great but they need to go to something more and joined with me every night and inshallah for the remaining nights as well will be my dear brother ali father assalamu alaikum alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa rahmatullah. Uh, thank you no not at all and We've dedicated these first five nights to the ladies and the children of Karbala. So we've covered Umm al banin we've covered Sayyid Zainab السلام, we've covered Sayyid Ruqayya and tonight we go to another woman but a woman who had a role that isn't appreciated enough for, if you like, the tragedy and why which she's associated with. Her name isn't said too often mm. and to be very clear, we're talking about the wife of Imam Hussein the mother of Ali and al Asghar Abdullah al Radhi, and this is of course Sayyidah Rabab alayhi salam. And we really wanted to dedicate and look at her involvement and her attachment to the tragedy, whilst also, of course, mentioning the tragedy of Ali and al Asghar oh. as well, inshallah. Yeah. So, I mean, just following on from the, th the, the, the theme, I think moving away just slightly um, from her stand, I think the fact that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam brought with him a six month old child mm. signified his true intent when he left Medina because mm. I think there was a very very um, nice saying from a non-Muslim actually he said if Hussein was after glory and the world and his desires and power then there was no reason for him to bring his women and children Excellent. not only bring his women and children but his six month old child who had to endure the three days or four days or actually had endured weeks of yep. traveling towards what Kufa and then, and then Karbala and then on top of that three days without water as mm. well so it's it's a tragedy which really really hits the heart mm, really sure. hits the heart and I think when we when we think about children one of the scary parts that again we, we, we disconnect from is traveling for kids in itself parents but okay we have to travel at this time mm. because their nap time is here, da 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 da. Yeah. And then on top of that, when they have no water and they start crying, that cry is unbearable for parents. Exactly. You know, what cry is this, etc., etc. And yeah. that whole journey in itself, whilst was a struggle like no other for Imam Hussein, hearing the news of Muslim being killed and then having to go to Muslim's child and saying to her, I am now your father, etc. Whilst dealing with all of these emotions and knowing what the end is, he has a six month old that he still has to look after, yeah, exactly. um, which, which makes it tough to fathom. But yeah. similar to what you just touched upon, there's, there's, there's a very subtle point here in that if we were to apply, and let's say Karbala, and let's say the event of Ashura were to take place this afternoon, okay? So today, and I use this as in terms of modern media coverage, for example, okay? Not so long ago in the UK, we had the incident of Baby P, if you remember. Um, so it's a, a baby that was almost tortured by, uh, I think, his parents. I think it was a, a, a male baby. So tortured by his parents. And it was all over the news, all over the news. At least for a month, there was then cases going on after that with, uh, you know, saying the council authorities didn't do enough, etc., yeah. etc. Now, I ask this. If Ashura were to take place this afternoon and there was enough media coverage there and they were to see that the ruler of the time i.e. the main party in power of your country, were to have killed a baby, that's it. 
news coverage like crazy. Indeed. Expenses was one thing, this is another. Outrage, yeah. The other side is to then say, well, actually, the ruler of the time kills the son of the opposing party's family. Oh. And when you put that together, it just m does make you ponder. Yazid ibn Muawiyah, may Allah judge him accordingly, an individual that represented Islam in that sense, right? He, he claimed that position. Oh. And he had the audacity to not only oppose the truth, but even if you'd say it wasn't the truth, astaghfirullah, that Imam Hussein wasn't from the truth, he's opposed a party and then killed the party's leader's son, oh. who's a baby. And the uproar would just be outrageous yeah. if we were to apply it. So that's just one thing I wanted to mention. But to go to Umar Rabab alayhi salam, and I think this is something that I, I, I really want to investigate today, which is this. Imam Hussein alayhi salam had the difficult task and nigh on impossible task of taking the baby out to the battlefield and receiving that arrow, you know, and we know the Masaib of it. But we don't appreciate the willpower of Umar Rabab in this situation. Yeah. A mother, so before all of this takes place, a mother who's still feeding her child has to actually hand over their baby with the most likely foresight that this baby won't return. And potentially she, I, I don't know myself, I don't know if she was told beforehand, this is what's going to happen to, to your son. And this is exactly how it's going to transpire. I have no idea if that was the case. But even if not, she probably had a feeling that giving this baby, there's going to be something that could happen there. And that handover is so symbolic and really shouldn't be underestimated in the service of Umar Abab at that moment for the cause. And it really reminds me of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi yeah. salam. That when the knock on the door comes, her life is secondary to that of not her husband, but to the Imam of her time. Oh. Sayyid Rabab in that moment, her love of her son is secondary to that of the requirement of her Imam, who oh. happens to be her husband. Oh. And this hidden service, this service that's perhaps behind the scenes, if we were to take the example of today in Majalis, we have the fortunate role of being able to, you know, talk about the message in front of people and that comes, you know, with difficulties, but of course people say, oh, you know, the limelight, da da da, da whatever. There are so many people serving behind the scenes, as we know, who do not get the credit that they deserve. So when we then look to Umar Rabab and the service that she actually offered, that was hidden, that wasn't as obvious perhaps as Imam Hussein going out. And I'm not undermining Imam Hussein's uh, involvement. That's why I'm saying we need to appreciate the service of Umar Rabab at this moment. And that she's gone out and she's had to serve in such a hidden way, but yet with such sincerity in order to actually be able to make that offering, if you like, to have that moment transpire. And I think the application to what we have here is this. Your service to Aba Abdullah, to the A'imma, to the ladies of Ahlul Bayt and thus for the service of Allah, even if it's hidden, do not underestimate it. If anything, it's more superior to that of those who gain potential exposure from the service. But it must, must, and this is for everyone, I say this most certainly to myself first, the sincerity that you must have when you serve in this way must be to that of Umar Rabab alayhi salam. Imam Ali says sincerity is the criterion for worship. Sincerity is the criterion for worship. Without the sincere intention, your worship may not be accepted. Your worship may even be a lot tougher. It's, if you use the analogy of revising for an exam, if you're revising for the sake of revising, it, it doesn't really soak in. If you're revising, you start to feel you're getting a reward and you're getting better at, the, you know, I can solve the equation now. You get a sense of, you know, excitement that you want to serve. And it's that sincerity in that revision that you're doing that I, I want to do it to get my A. Mm. Similarly, the sincerity when you then prostrate to Allah, the sincerity when you recite to the masses, the sincerity when you pack the food, the tabarruk for the to give out after the mention, if it's, if it's there, the connection and the worship will transcend and we take inspiration from Sayyidina Rabab alayhi salam. So with that, we then now think about that actual let go that Sayyidina Rabab had to do, that difficulty when, you know, that mother, yes, she has to give away, but she now has to live with the absence of her child for those moments being unknown what's going to happen. She then has to live with the return of that child and Imam Hussein chucking the blood into the air. But I think what breaks a mother's heart the most is 
seeing a cradle bear, not being able to hold their baby in their own hands, the absence of holding your baby, not being a parent, mm -hmm. but I can imagine it being absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. No, I can totally, I can totally um, actually relate as well because mm. um, I've you know, just had a, had a young child and he's about the age of what Abdullah would have um, would have been as well, uh, and just the thought of him in pain, and it could be a minor cold, mm. or, or it could be, uh, you know, it could be a bumped his head or something, head, yeah. a little cut. That, you know, me, me, and me, and my partner will go like, oh, what's going on? What's mm. going on? You just constantly want to be around, but the fact that the desperation that you can't provide for your child. Is, is especially from a woman's point of view mm. as well because that's, that's the reason why they're created. It's, it's part of their nature to be able to feed their offspring. Sense. And if they don't have that, don't have that ability, they feel like they're absolutely redundant. Mm. Not only that coupled with the, you know, the, the crippling son and the conditions of war and the fear of what's going to happen to her husband and, and cousins and whatever, it must have been well, some, some, some sort of yeah. a mind frame uh, to go through. So it, you that. mentioned Cradle as well as in the poet. Nuri Sardar, um, in this poem, which refers to uh, Sayyid Rabab as well, with her conversing with uh, Abdullah Radiya. I don't fear if from your cradle you depart, you sleep in the deepest oceans of my heart. But if for only a second from me you part, each ocean in my heart would be torn apart. My tongue wanted water, but I asked you first. I knew from your eyes the torture of your thirst. You did not know words, so with cries I conversed. If I had tears to cry, your tongue I'd have nursed. Oh my child, oh my child, oh my child, oh my child. Missing your smile, I told Hussein to take him. Each of his cries sings to me a painful hymn. His smile was now nothing more than a dream. And from his thirst, not a single tear would stream. I say cradled you a bundle of roses His eyes for tears to drink your eye touches You yearned a kiss so that your cry touches Yet, oh child, your neck an arrow kisses Yet, O oh child, your neck An arrow kisses O oh my child O oh my child O oh my child O oh my child oh Allah oh, thanks to the poets um, Nuri Sada for that poem. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. It's it's that that notion of the arrow kissing that neck mm. that really strikes. It really it's quite subtle, uh, but it, it, there's a deep deep meaning to it because obviously the neck is is probably the most 
um, it's fragile, tender, yeah, tender exactly. and fragile part of of a of a baby's uh, body, uh, and for that to be severed from one side to the other, of course, is difficult to hear and difficult to probably bear as well at the same time. And the 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 tragedy is is that you have the Ahl Bayt on one side and the opposition on the other, and this side and not. It's not like they're not renowned for killing young infants either. Mm. With our dear Prince Mohsin alayhi salam as well. It's when it comes to haq and batal, Ahl Bayt alayhi salam gave everything, regardless. They gave everything and this side took everything. everything yeah. Merciless, absolutely merciless. But inshallah we receive the intercession of Abdullah al in this, in this life and the next. There's, a, there's something very... It's almost like strange to, to, to use this word, the word of marriage, when it comes to Karbala. And usually people think Hazrat Qasim being, being a tradition, but I, I want to take a different approach, which is there are two significant kind of couples, if you like, in, in Karbala, I feel. The first that we always talk about is, of course, Umm al and Imam Ali alayhi salam mm -hmm. creating Abu Fadl and, and, and the children to serve Imam Hussein. And a similar notion with that of Imam Hussein and his dear wife. Um, Rabab alayhi salam. And one of the things that I feel we need to take away is this. That moment where Um Rabab alayhi salam had to give over Abdullah al Radi and actually even partake in this journey to Karbala. And there's a relationship there to look at, which is that marriage between the two. And by no means was this journey easy. One of the toughest we'll ever see in that history we'll ever see. How, when that discussion took place between Imam Hussein and his dear wife, how did, they how did they ensure they were aligned that this was the trip they had to take? That they had to uproot the family, the extended family, the friends, if you want to call them the companions, and take the journey. How did they align that they had to then take their son as part of this offering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How did they align? And I really believe it stems down to that marriage bond that they had and what was the actual bond between it. Mm. And it's this. We always talk about this submission to Allah and the service to Allah. And if your marriage is bound by the gel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else, such decisions become so, so easy and such marriages prosper to a level that cannot be understood and just appreciated like we do now between the marriage that we see between of the exact one that we're talking about. It's ensuring that any partnership and marriage and even family generally is founded on this submission to Allah. Because with that you just can't go wrong. You align every single time. If one person then falls out and says, you know, I do not want to align with, the, with, this, with this decision because, you know, it, it doesn't match with the flow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they should, they are right to say, okay, this is it, I need to separate them. Everyone must be aligned towards Allah. And I say this to those looking for spouses and those in relationships, that whilst this is a somber 10 days, don't neglect this message, which is when finding a partner and when establishing your partnership, and when you're nursing your partnership, ensure it's all solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So practically speaking, what is it? It's things like waking up for fajr. Find a partner that you know will help you or that you'll complement each other to make it happen. Find a partner that will say, are you tired on the ninth night of, Ash of Ashram Muharram? Let that tiredness be the case and offer it to Allah. Let that be your offering. Let's go together. I'm going to drag you with me. Let's go. Even if it's for 30 minutes, we're in the measures. Let's go. Let's ensure we avoid X, Y, Z locations and the husband and wife should be so aligned. And these are the futile level. What we need to be preparing is that if that soil is as such that it's embedded with the gel of Allah, then when inshallah the 12th Imam arrives and he says, oh couple, I need you as the husband to do this. I need you as the wife to do this. It's like easy, job done. We know what the service is. Oh. You don't then have that conversation at that point to say, you know, I... I'm not sure I want to do this. Oh, but it's for Allah. Mm, I'm not sure. Mm. We don't want to get to that point. Yeah. And I think that's how potentially they got to this ability to offer this sacrifice, how they managed to align on this decision. And there's that very famous hadith from the Prophet that said at many, many weddings, but I reiterate it for he says, the beauty of a woman's faith must be given priority over the beauty of her face.
and of course the vice versa is the, is the same. The beauty of a man is uh, the beauty of a man should be uh, inferior to that of the beauty of their faith. The faith is always the superior part, and that's within family, within relationships, and even extends to friends. Because none of this would have been possible if Imam Hussein didn't have those seven, those companions, which people say well, we'll never see such strong companions again. What was it that bound them together? It was illustrated when the time of Salah came and despite being in a battle people offer themselves as shields for the arrows so the congregation could pray. Allah. And for me a very simple point to take for this is that it's Umr Bab and Imam Hussein founded and had fostered that relationship on the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. So inshallah we can do the same and of course that enabled Imam Hussein to then having taken this child from Umr Bab to walk into that battlefield and to take that offering to them and to take the offering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah. and we know that he walks after the incident happens he walks between the tent and then he goes back seven times chucking that blood into the air and it doesn't come back to the earth almost asking Allah accept this from me if you don't accept anything else from me this should show my sole dedication to your cause yeah. Yeah. and that moment of Imam Hussein then having to return and to give the news and to show what had happened, the heart, the heart shudders. Yeah. Um, just on, on that point as well, I mean, the, the, the story of Abdullah al Radiyah ensued as um, I think Omar Rabab or, or actually Lady Zainab, because Sayyid al Rabab was, was shy mm. because Imam Hussein had already had so many burdens, and Sayyid al Rabab didn't want to add another burden to her husband Allah. so she didn't want to say to him can we find some sort of water because at this point Abu al Abbas had now gone and most of the companions yeah, yeah, all yeah. of them had gone and all of the all of the household had gone as well so at this point it's like it's now reaching desperation but she didn't want to add to the burden of Imam Hussain Salam. so she had to consult with Sayyidina Zainab and Sayyidina Zainab had to go to her brother and say look this is the situation could you at least oh, plead yeah. with the army Tell them, look, this is a situation. I'm not here to fight anyone. So he takes the child, goes to the, the enemies um, and, and shows it. There's no weapons involved here. And this time everyone's confused because they think that, OK, this is the final moments mm -hmm. now because Imam Hussein is now coming out to fight. Mm -hmm. um, but no, he comes out with a six month old child, a baby in his hand. He said, if you are here to fight me, then fine. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here and I, I will respond. But this, this, the sin, there is no sin of this young, innocent child. So all I ask is that you quench his thirst. No one, forget all of the companions, forget all of the women and children. Just this six month, please, if you can, a bit of, just a drop of water will do. And of course, there were murmurings within the camp of mm. Yazid. What do they do? Split sides. Split sides. Yeah. Some people were actually crying. Some people were thinking, well, we're here to kill a man. But what sin has this child have? So at the time, uh, there was an order towards Harmala, and Harmala threw a couple of arrows which were very effective. Um, one of them was in the heart of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The other one was in the right eye, I believe, of Abu al-Fadl Abbas alayhi salam. But I think the, one of the most shocking ones was the fact that he prepared an arrow, not just any arrow, but prepared an arrow which would kill cattle, like a, 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 an animal the size of a horse or, or a cow or whatever. So he prepared that kind of arrow to the uh, throat of Abdullah Radhi. And it was also said in, in, in the narrations that when he looked, he saw that there was a shine just below the arm of, uh, of Imam Hussein salam, And there was a shine in that throat. And that's exactly where he directed the arrow. When he hit the arrow, Imam Hussein stayed very calm because he knew this was going to happen. He knew that he wanted to show the world that I am not here to fight for greed or power or politics or money or wealth i'm here literally just to restore the teachings of my my grandfather and if it means the the, the demise of my six month child That's in so front good. of everyone then so be it oh, okay. then so be it and when it happened the blood started to flow and, and it was also narrated as well that abdullah he he as soon as the arrow hit he he would flap his hands, they say, like a, a young dove would, would, would flap, uh, flap their wings 
flap his hands for a couple of seconds and that's when his soul was taken. And this is when the blood that was flowing and gushing from the neck of Abdullah was thrown towards the air and none of it came back as the historians pointed out because all of it went towards the sky. And this is when he said um, uh, those lines that تَقَبَّلْ هَذَا القربان Oh Allah, please accept this sacrifice in the way of Islam. And uh, the poem is, is, uh, is actually related to a father and, uh, and a young son from Nur al-Sardari. It says, He cries for what sin did my child die. He cries for what sin did my child die. He cries and throws his blood toward the sky. This is the father who today watched his son massacred as a child in his two arms. The tears of thousands of prophets in his eyes and the blood of Muhammad stained on his palms. Feeling the arrow, he waves his tiny arms and the voice of his father no longer comes the eyes of Hussein blinded before his death watching as his young child an arrow harms watching as his young child an arrow harms he cries why does my child from me shy? He cries and throws his blood toward the sky. He cries and throws his blood toward the sky. This is my child, six months, what was his sin? It tortures me to see my child thirsty. I forget my own thirst and only saw his. Upon the beloved, the pangs of thirst would pray. Yet for all the pain I had seeing his thirst, soaked in blood, I can't see my child this way. With an arrow in his neck in my way. My beloved to death's hand I gave away My beloved to death's hand I gave away He cries Lifeless why does in my hands lie He cries And throws his blood toward the sky Every father overjoys with his son's birth And I wonder if my enemies have sons What father evil or good can bear the weight Of knowing that his infant murdered becomes If me and my brothers were of Hashim's mood then our sons within our eyes were truly sons The weight of losing a son matches the weight Of the weight of happiness when a son comes Of the weight of happiness when a son comes He cries and all fathers to his grief cries He cries and throws his blood toward the sky He cries and throws his blood toward the sky Hey, thanks for the poet, Nuri.
To end, just a hadith from Imam al Sadiq, our holy sixth Imam. He says, Verily, when Abu Abdullah Hussein ibn Ali died, the seven heavens, the seven earths, everything within them, everything between them, mm. everyone which circulates around them, paradise, hell, and everything that our Lord has created from among that which can be seen and that which, and that which cannot be seen cried over him. AKA every single thing in the creation seen or not seen in this realm and not, not in this realm. Upon the demise and murder of Aba Abdullah, each of those creations cried over him. And inshallah, we end by asking for Allah's intercession of Umm Rabab and Abdullah alayhim salam in this life and the hereafter. We ask Allah for the intercession of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam in this life and the hereafter. And we end with a few lines of poetry to reflect upon these tears that we offer to Aba Abdullah. Ashura's a school of lessons. Hussein taught me defiance. Abbas taught me selflessness. Zainab, she taught me patience. Qasim taught me sacrifice. Death over life, his preference. Layla gave Ali Akbar Muhammad's last resemblance. Between the hands of Hussein, Hur taught me repentance. Abbas taught me insanity, is but a lover's science. Ashura was not a day, it's timelessness, it's brilliance. It repeats daily in the heart, always a beacon of guidance. Mm. Ashura was not a day, it's timelessness, it's brilliance. It repeats daily in the heart, always a beacon of guidance. Always a beacon of guidance. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and insha'Allah join us for tomorrow's show. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.